how high the mood is a great jazz standard. So we're gonna look at that today. We're gonna learn the melody. And I'm gonna talk about things you need to think about when you're learning a jazz tune, a jazz standard like this one. Then we're gonna look at what people have done with this tune in the past, like Charlie Parker obviously wrote Ornithology, which is a contrafact over the changes of How High the Moon. Then we also have another contrafact by Leno Tristano called L Lenny's Bird, Bird Lenny, Lenny Bird. So you're gonna look at that as well. There are other famous recordings, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. We're gonna steal some of Ella Fitzgerald's licks over this tune. She has a very famous recording of this tune. I think it's live from Germany. And also Bud Powell. And then we're gonna look at Barry Harris scales. So lots of stuff to look at. Let's just start by learning the melody, shall we? So as I'm sure a lot of you realize that that's not really how you play a jazz tune. Now that is the tune, those are the notes. That's how it's written in the real book, more or less. But I think one of the differences between jazz and other genres is that when we look at written music, a lead sheet, we're not supposed to play exactly what's on the page. We're supposed to come up with this interpretation, add rhythm and add phrasing to it and add a, doesn't have to be those chords. There are many variations on the chord changes as well. And as a jazz musician, you're supposed to have this ability to do that on the fly. You're supposed to come up with this rhythmic swinging variation of the melody. Right? So some people add more to a melody than others. Some people change it a lot and other musicians change it not so much. I would say that, for example, Frank Sinatra would play a melody pretty much as it is. So these are old like musical tunes, right? So you can find original versions where the melody is very straightforward. And then you can find, you know, versions where people are really changing things up. So that's where you want to find your own way of doing things, right? But I know you all know this, you know, all know that you don't play the melody like that. But whereas in classical music, you're pretty much supposed to play what's on the page. And uh, of course you have to add musicality and phrasing and all that, but you don't really change a rhythm if you're playing a piece by Bach, right? You, you, you're not supposed to do that as far as I understand. That is not to diminish that music in any way, obviously. And it's just a different, different way of doing things. And we all know this, but we haven't necessarily thought too much about how to do that. So if you are more new to this stuff, a couple of things you can do is to look at big band charts, for example. The two things I would recommend. One is to look at big band charts because in big band, everybody can't be, you know, changing things their own way. It would be chaos. So you have to write down exactly how the melody is supposed, you want the melody to sound. So imagine if a big band played like that. Do, 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 do. That would be terrible, right? Like no big band would sound like that. So imagine a big band. Ba do, 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 da, ba do, ba da, do, ba do, ba da, do, da, ba do, ba do, That's how a big band would phrase. But then you would actually have to write it out. So here is an example of a big band chart. Mm -hmm. 
So that's pretty straightforward, but that gives you an idea of, you know, you have all these accents and stuff like that. So that's the one thing you can do, or you can write it out yourself, a melody, the way you want it to be, as if it was a big band arrangement. Another thing you can do is to listen to famous recordings of uh, this tune and, and write out, actually transcribe how they're phrasing the melody. And, but I think a mistake we make, we take two advanced versions. Don't take like shikoreas right away. Start with easier versions because more modern players, they would change things a lot and you might actually lose kind of the tune. And that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for how to phrase this tune. So I think a mistake a lot of people make is that they, you know, they want to sound like Kurt Rosenwinkel or something. And they try to go to that kind of uh, level too, too quickly. So I don't even think that Kurt Rosenwinkel necessarily would play this tune, right? So, and if they did plays like that, they would probably change it somehow, maybe change the meter, reharm it and uh, something like that. Because I guess we live in a time today where people feel that what can be said over a tune like this have already been said. So you need to kind of take it to the next level. But we're trying to learn the jazz here. We're trying to learn the jazz language. If we're trying to learn jazz, I think we need to listen to the old versions of tunes and try to figure out what they were doing. So I digress, let's move on. So if you're gonna play this tune with, or any jazz tune with a trio, let's say, the first thing you need to do is to be able to add rhythm and phrasing to the melody. And then also, you might have noticed, I threw in some chords, like chord stabs, if I, especially if I'm playing without a piano player. So a lot of people, or some people ask me, what that is, what I'm doing there. And for to me, it's more of a rhythmic effect than an uh, actual chordal effect, if you know what I mean. So it doesn't really matter, but guy tones, the third and seven. That's the third and seven of that chord. So that's great, but that's also a little bit basic. So. What I like to do is I like to, let's say uh, the first chord is a G major seven. I like to think about this chord, which is a G major seven on the top or the bottom four strings or down here, or G six even. Then you can drop a string, like any of the notes, like we talked about in, if you follow my channel, you know I love to talk about this. So for example, this chord. G major seven, or oh, this it's a G major six. Doesn't really matter. They're up for grabs, or this one. So even like if I could play two notes of the chord, like like a power chord. I remember I was lifting something by Kurt Rosenwinkel. He was playing like a power chord. It just blew my mind. Like you're not supposed to play, play power chords in jazz, right? But if you do it rhythmically, it sounds cool. Or it could also be the root and the seventh, right? So, root seventh. That's a kind of a Kurt Rosenwinkel technique. I've talked about that in the previous video and I'll link to that in the description below. All right, so now that we can play the melody, let's move on to think about the scales. So we're gonna look at Barry Harris stuff. And just like before, I'm gonna to refer to a YouTube channel called Things I Learned from Barry Harris. I have mentioned this channel many times before and I'll link to it. And uh, I'm taking this from one of his videos and uh, I'll just show you the scales here. So. We're gonna play G, G major for the G major. For the major chords, we're gonna play major scale up and down. And then for the two five ones, we're gonna do the Barry Harris trick and ignore the two chord. So in this case, G minor. And think about the C7, which calls for a mixolydian scale. 
because those two scales are the same scale. I shouldn't say that they're not the same scale, they're the same notes. G Dorian and C Mixolydian are the same notes. So we play C7 for those two bars. You would just think of the whole two bars as C7. And then F major 7. B flat 7. So here we have a, the chords moving a little bit faster. And then we're going to play a G minor 6 diminished scale. G minor 6 diminished. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can check out my videos on Barry Harris scales or any other video on Barry Harris. There's a lot of stuff about this on YouTube. So the E flat, I guess that's like a, a harmonic minor scale. And then uh, G, and then G major 7. I'm gonna play this with a uh, mu score here. Playing the G major up, landing on the G sharp for that E7, and then D, D mix up. Then same thing. Can you hear the chords go by? Same thing. But here it's major, right? And then it's this C minor to F7. We're gonna play F7 because we're ignoring the two chord. And then... So all this is gonna be on my Patreon page as PDFs with tabs and everything, or you can go to the, the video with things I learned from Barry Harris. So let me play this over the backing track I found on YouTube. Then you can try to improvise using those scales, which is very two, simple. I'm sticking with the scales, pretty much. like to do is that at the end they kind of pedal on the dominant chord, extend the dominant chords over like the last, it's a very common thing to do and that's where you play a crazy diminished. 
right? So there are a couple of variations on the changes that people do. I noticed, for example, here, they don't do that C minor F7. So it was clashing a little bit what I was doing. They were playing A minor D7 there instead of C minor. It's a little bit different uh, depending on what style, how bebop-y you want to be. Some people don't go to uh, G major after the minor there. They go to B minor. But I prefer to go to G major 7 there. So they're kind of up for grabs. So that's why you want to be a little bit careful when you're comping. To leave it, it's better to leave it open if you're not sure what's going on. Because if you play too many chords, it can kind of get in, gets in the way of the soloist. Depending on the kind of if you're playing, if you're playing traditional old style, then you want to play big chords. There's another thing that people like to do. This change is very interesting. The E flat that goes to G minor there. It's almost like it's an E. flat G G7 C minor D7 so that can be very nice to imply But I think that's, again, having said that, it's one of those things that can be nice, but if you do it too much and every time, it can kind of get in the way of whoever is soloing, because if you are soloing and the piano player, for example, is throwing all these chord changes at you, you kind of, it's better to leave it open. So that was the melody and some scales. Then you try to improvise using those scales. Let's look at the contrafact on ornithology. When I play those Parker heads, I prefer to play them down here. Like... I, I think it sounds better down there, even though we're kind of dropping an octave, I guess. Let me play along with the Muse score track. Parker heads, you want to be able to kind of play it kind of rhythmically. That's a really good thing to practice those Parker heads, and you have to constantly practice them, come back to them, because they, if you don't play them all the time, they kind of, you forget them. And I think though, it's a, uh, little bit of a mistake that some people also make is that they go to a jazz teacher right they want to learn how to play jazz and the teacher tells them well learn a charlie parker solo a charlie parker head and uh it can be kind of overwhelming if you have never played jazz before and you're coming from a rock kind of background because it's a very different way of playing so this is a horn melody right it's not for guitar at all and so i'm not saying we shouldn't study those heads I just said that we sh it's very important to do that but maybe not at first so if you're completely new to bebop guitar I would suggest listening to a bebop guitarist like Grand Green and he's pl he plays these tunes but he it's more kind of 
guitar friendly. So maybe start with Kenny Burrell, uh, Grant Green, and that stuff, and then don't go to Shot Parker right away because it's very, very hard to play these heads on the guitar, right? Let me try to play this with a backing track, and then I'm gonna take these phrases and repeat them. <laughs> their licks and then fill in the blanks I'm gonna fill in with uh, uh, the scales we were playing with uh, Barry Harry scales <laughs> take those ideas right and use them as licks and try to over other tunes and try other Charlie Parker heads because that forces you to think about how those licks of so the notes relate to the chord and all that stuff which is really good okay so this is Bud Powell slowed down playing ornithology it's gonna be a little bit different Fitzgerald also slowed down. So it's in 
D flat, E flat. And also a lot faster. Uh, so this is a really, really good uh, thing to transcribe. Also, notice that when we listen to Bud Powell, right, he's taking the same, same melody, but he's adding his own ideas to it. So again, there were some really nice licks that you can take from that. So I'm all actually only gonna listen to the beginning here of Ella's solo and take these phrases. So great. So if we transpose it back to G. She's kind of landing on the ninth. And then. Coltrane pattern. I call those Coltrane patterns. I've talked about that in previous videos as well. And then outlining the third. already you have a bunch of material that you can work with but you need to be able to kind of figure out how those phrases relate to the chord right the ninth chord tones third seventh so it's a good thing to practice in different keys also very good to transcribe vocalists because if you think about it the vocal instrument if you will is the, probably the instrument that's closest to your head <laughs> to your mind you're just singing what you're hearing and also it's a good idea to learn the lyrics because if you know the lyrics of a song you're gonna phrase it differently better uh, I, I think that's a valid argument that so, you can hear the difference when somebody knows the melody or the lyrics of a song when they're playing it on a horn for example because you know the phrasing makes sense from how you would sing the tune. So learning lyrics to jazz standards is a, I'm, I'm not saying I know all the lyrics, but at least have some idea of what the, the lyrics are. Okay, so the idea is that you take all these phrases and you try to implement them into your playing and try to add it to your vocabulary and treat those phrases as licks. So I guess some people wouldn't like that. They would say that, no, you're supposed to kind of lock yourself in your apartment and think about how the universe uh, can kind of uh, be a creative force and come up with your own unique way of playing that nobody's ever heard before. So that's not how I look at all this. To me, it's um, jazz is, you know, it's a jam session music. You're, you're playing music, you're having a good time and you, it's a tradition. You're, stand, you're stepping into a tradition and you want to respect what people have played before you. And if I quote or if somebody quotes Ella Fitzgerald, that's a, that's a celebration of the tradition and the history and of Ella Fitzgerald, just like she's quoting Charlie Parker in her solo. You should definitely listen to that solo. It's amazing. So it's a Ella Fitzgerald in live in Germany, I'm pretty sure. I will link to these things in the description below. Finally, let's look at Lenny Tristano. Lenny's, Lenny Bird, Lenny Bird with Lee Konitz Quartet also slowed down. <laughs> Thank you. 
Tristano contrafact melodies there's so much to learn from that at the end here it's a Coltrane pattern that's a that's a hemiola so it's like a three beat figure right to learn there and uh, I could make a whole lesson on just that this melody I have made a lesson on Lena Tristano heads or Lena Tristano contrafacts that I'll link to also as I think you know by now like all this stuff is on my patreon page thanks to my paid patrons and I shall now try to play that with the backing track <laughs> That was a lot of stuff and uh, the whole idea here is that you listen to different versions of uh, a famous standard you don't necessarily have to listen to the original version some people get obsessed with listening to the original version and the original changes there is some uh, merit to uh, doing that but it's better to find versions that you like and taking stuff that you like because you're more likely to incorporate that into your playing if that makes sense so obviously another really really famous version of this tune is uh, mary ford and les paul i think they played in a major i think that was a really big hit maybe the biggest hit with this song also i think the first hit with this song was benny goodman but i'm not sure so i'm not a jazz historian i'm just trying to figure out how to play this music and i hope you follow me along on that ride so that was how high the moon uh, I hope you learned something and thank you for your time and attention and thank you to my patrons and I shall see you next time.